thank you very much uh, to all. I'm, uh, I'm going to invite some more uh, to, to sit around the table if you wish. Uh, don't be shy. So today we, uh, the, we have three speakers. We have uh, Dr. Peter Kleik, who is a scientist and a communicator on water and climate issues. In uh, 1987, he co-founded the independent think tank, the Pacific Institute which he led as president until mid-2016, uh, when he became President Emeritus. He received a prestigious MacArthur Genius Fellowship, and he's a, an elected member of the U.S. National Academy of Science. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and a winner on the Vento Shao Award from the International Water Resource Association and the United States Water Prize from the U.S. Water Alliance. I'm not going to do justice to your uh, uh, distinguished uh, career, but we are, we are delighted to have you. And so uh, Peter is going to start uh, and, and present some of his uh, uh, innovative and, and, and creative work. Then we'll have uh, a presentation by our, our colleague Anders on the uh, water scarcity, beyond scarcity report, which uh, he's happy to. Uh, uh, to offer to whoever uh, wants it, uh, including uh, the copies here, but also, uh, uh, you know, please follow up with him. And uh, then we will have uh, Christian, uh, who is a former colleague of mine uh, at the IMF, uh, who will be discussing the two uh, presentations. So each of you would have uh, 20, about 20 minutes or so, and uh, Christian would have a maximum of 10 minutes. So Peter, the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so a, just a little quick background. Uh, uh, I'm the, the President Emeritus of the Pacific Institute. The Institute is a research institute in California. Uh, we work broadly on global freshwater issues. Uh, the Institute, for example, is the Science Secretariat for the UN CEO Water Mandate, the water component of the UN Global Compact work and we do a lot of work on corporate stewardship around water. Uh, we do a lot of work broadly on sustainability of water issues uh, from the technology side to the economic side to the institutional side. Uh, and we work on conflict over water, uh, international disputes, violence over water. And it's this last piece of what we do that I'm going, I'm going to address quickly today in the context of some of these much broader issues. Um, I'm, a, I'm a climatologist and a hydrologist by training. Uh, much of the work the Institute does is science-related, but with a policy component. Um, so I'm going to talk about water, climate, and security. Uh, in the context of peak water, the idea that we're increasingly running into constraints on water, and that's related to this broader issue of scarcity, uh, and in the context of the broader discussion about environmental security and, uh, and conflict over resources. Um, as I'm sure, I'm sure you know, the definition of the word security is itself problematic. People argue about what security means. Uh, the definition of it has changed over time, and it depends on what your own background is, what you might think about that. Um, I'm going to talk about it in the context of violence associated with water resources. And there's a long history, and I'll come back to this a little bit later, of violence related to water resources. Uh, and that con that, that Violence takes many forms, and I'm going to talk specifically about that as well a little bit later. But in particular, I'm going to talk about it as a trigger of conflict, as a weapon of conflict, and as a casualty or target uh, of conflict. Um, I, I would like to argue that the risks of water-related disputes is, is growing rather than shrinking. Uh, and in part, this has to do with scarcity, which Andres is going to talk more about. Uh, but there are other components of that as well. Um, and that uh, a whole set of water-related factors, scarcity, quality, competition, uh, has an impact on economic well-being and human health and ecosystem health, but it also, uh, water issues broadly have an impact on security. So a little bit of background on the security debate, um, in part, the discussion about environment and security is an outgrowth of the end of the Cold War, maybe the end of the Cold War, uh, in the, the mid-1980s. Uh, 
But it was also a time when environmental issues were growing on the international agenda. We were understanding more about environmental problems, uh, about resource issues. They were becoming more international rather than local. Uh, in the 60s and the 70s, a lot of the environmental issues were local air quality, local water quality. <laughs> and then uh, issues became much broader. We had ozone depletion, we have climate change, we had transborder environmental pollution, things that, that became more international and more political. Uh, that also contributed to this debate. Um, in part, this was a political science debate. It was an academic debate about the definition of security. And uh, there, if you look at the literature in the 1980s and the 1990s, there's a fairly big literature about what environmental security means. And I'm not going to go into any of that. I think that was sort of an academic debate at the time. Uh, but, but for those of you interested in it, there's a, a history there as well. Um, and today, the discussion about conflict over water and environmental security more broadly uh, is enriched by a, a, a much better understanding at the regional level about water. Um, there are lots of diverse case studies now, water in the Middle East, uh, water in particular river basins, uh, discussion about different kinds of political agendas and political treaties at the UN associated with water. All of that has contributed to where we are today. Um, critical issues, which my guess is this audience mostly doesn't need, but uh, as, as perhaps you know, fresh water is very widely shared internationally. Half of the land area of the planet is in, what's we, in what we call an international river basin, a river that's shared by two or more nations. Uh, there are over 260 international rivers, rivers that cross um, political borders. Uh, and of course, every river that you work on in, in the Middle East and North Africa is effectively not, not, not everyone, but almost everyone is, is an international river. Uh, there's growing competition for water. We have rising populations. We have rising economic demand as our economies grow. Demand for water often, although I would argue in a separate talk, which I'm not going to give today, doesn't always grow, but often grows. Uh, there are substantial inequities and development challenges, and there are inequities in uh, the natural distribution of water. Obviously, we have water-rich areas of the world and water-poor areas of the world. That's fundamental basic hydrology. But there are also very important economic and social and political inequities. And those inequities contribute to competition and disputes over water resources. And there's growing environmental degradation. All of the water that humans use come out of natural ecosystems. Uh, many of the most severe ecological problems that we face around the world uh, are partly or fully attributable to the way we manage and, and use fresh water, especially, of course, impacts on aquatic ecosystems. Um, finally, there's a political component to this, and that is uh, efforts to resolve water-related disputes are often inadequate. And I would be remiss if I didn't point out uh, there is also enormous and long history of cooperation over water resources. And I'll talk about that a little more at the end. Um, but when there is dispute and violence over water resources, what we have is a failure of the political system or a failure of institutions to address adequately water-related disputes. And so understanding where water-related disputes happen and when there is violence over water and why there is violence associated with water resources is a critical piece to moving toward what, what we hope for, which is more cooperation. Uh, and so understanding causes and, and, and the background of, of conflict hopefully will help, us lead, help lead us toward more cooperation. Um, I also want to be very explicit that I'm not talking about water wars. Water wars is something that um, newspapers love to write about, uh, journalists love, headline editors love because it's a short headline and it's alliterative and it, it, it produces clicks on the internet. I'm, I'm not talking about water wars. I think this is a more complex problem than that. Um, and this gets back to the, the categorization I briefly mentioned at the beginning. Um, I'm going to talk about, again, three categories. Water as a trigger of conflict. And this is the scarcity 
issue that Andres is, I think, going to talk about in, in more depth. Uh, there are examples where, and I'm going to talk about the history of conflict in a moment, but there are examples where scarcity of water, where access to water has been a contributing factor or a trigger of conflict. Uh, and we think about the pastoralists and the farmers in, in Kenya and other parts of Africa where access to water sources uh, uh, is, in fact, a, an important component of that. Uh, the second category is water as a weapon during conflicts, conflicts that start for other reasons. And as we, again, as we all know, I think, conflict and, and wars start for very complicated religious, ideological, economic, political reasons. Uh, there, there's, it's very difficult ever to point to any given conflict and say this was caused by a single factor. Um, and the same is true for resources. But in conflicts that start for whatever reason, we do see water used as a weapon. Um, the Han River in Korea is a source of tension between North Korea and South Korea. Uh, it flows from North Korea to South Korea. Uh, Seoul is just below the border in South Korea. The North Koreans have built a dam uh, above the border, and there is concern that that dam could be used as a weapon during a conflict that starts for whatever uh, whatever reason. Uh, diversion of water away from villages in Iraq in 2017 or opening of the floodgates on dams on the Tigris and the Euphrates River. Water has been used as a weapon in that region uh, recently. Poisoning of wells in Somalia. There are many examples where uh, where water itself or water resources have been a weapon during conflict. And the third category uh, is water systems as targets or casualties of conflicts. Again, conflicts that start for whatever reason, uh, where civilian water systems are targeted during conflict or civilian infrastructure that is related to energy and water are targeted during conflicts. We saw this in World War II. We saw it in the Vietnam War with the targeting of irrigation systems and dams. And unfortunately, in recent years, we've seen it very extensively uh, in Iraq and Yemen and Syria. Uh, and I'll come, back, I'll come back to some of that again. Um, a little digression, um, and it's related to this water wars question, and that's the issue of causality versus influence. Um, uh, is, and I'm a climate scientist in part by training. Uh, we get this all the time in, in the growing discussion about extreme events in the climate world. Is the following extreme event, a hurricane, a flood, a drought, caused by climate change? I get that question all the time. And what I'd like to do is argue that's the wrong question. And, and if a reporter comes to me and said, was Hurricane Michael caused by climate change? I don't answer it. I say, that's the wrong question. The question you should be asking is any extreme event or any political conflict influenced by some other factor? Was Hurricane Michael influenced by climate change? Because climate scientists can't tell you when, whether a particular extreme event is caused by climate change yet, mostly. But we can say that Climate change is influencing increasingly extreme events. Hurricane Michael is, was stronger than it otherwise would have been because the warm water that the hurricane traveled over, which fuels hurricanes, was warmer than it otherwise would have been because of climate change. The storm surge was worse than it otherwise would have been because sea level rise has risen nine inches over the last century because of climate change. And that influences extreme events. And the same argument can be made about resources and conflict. I, I try not to argue that water causes conflict. And there may be examples where, where we could argue it does. But it's much clearer to argue that resource issues are influencing politics and violence and understanding the roles that they play and the influence that they play is a critical part of this. And that's a little bit of a digression, but, it, but it's a semantic one and it's an important one for those people working in the field. Sorry to, uh, to be provocative, but can we say it, it causally increased the velocity and the, uh, and, and the, uh, the damage that, uh, that the hurricane caused? Yes, so but, that, I, but I, would, I would describe that as an influence. 
um, rather than causing the hurricane, making the hurricane come into, into existence when it otherwise wouldn't have. Now, it's possible that as we get better in the climate science community, we'll, we'll understand causality better as well. But, but my point is these are more complicated than, than often portrayed or questioned in, in the media. So again, as background, uh, one of the things we do at the Institute is we maintain something called the water conflict chronology. Uh, we've, we've, it's a database on water-related conflicts. It is, uh, we've, we've maintained it for almost 30 years now. Um, I would argue it's the most comprehensive database of violence associated with water resources uh, around. Uh, we're actually now in the process of integrating it with a series of other conflict-related databases to make sure that we, we have as up-to-date data as possible. And it, it includes information about trigger, weapon, target. It includes uh, geolocation data. It includes information about the parties involved and a little bit of background. And each entry in the database has a citation uh, and, and resource information associated with it. Um, you can't really see it here, but, but there, you can get a chronological list. Uh, you can get an interactive map, which I'll show you in a, in a second. And uh, the database is available to be downloaded for those of people who want to work with it from a data point of view. It's an open source uh, data set. Uh, this is just a screenshot of the chronology. Um, uh, on the left, you have a list, and on the right, each of those little red dots is one of the events. And you can click on the dot, and you can follow it uh, to the specific information about, about those events. Uh, we've done a little bit of analysis, uh, a regional analysis. Oh, before I get to that, uh, this is a time series of the number very simply, the number of events per year over the last uh, 87 years, since 1930. I should say the chronology goes back to 2500 BC. The earliest entries are more than 4,000 years ago. Um, and the first recorded, literally recorded in tablets, dispute was between the city-states of Uma and Lagash and in between the Tigris and, Tigris and the Euphrates rivers in ancient Mesopotamia, a dispute over irrigation canals. Um, this is simply a graph that shows the number of events per year uh, over the last 80 years, and it, as obviously it shows a very substantial increase in recent years. I think part of that is probably better reporting in recent years. Um, basically, when there's any violence over water today, we hear about it a few minutes later, typically, <coughs> given the way we set up our system. I think that was probably not true 40 or 50 years ago, but nevertheless, I would argue this is a worrisome trend. Question, how yeah. do you define okay. Um, uh, so we, we include an entry in the database if there's violence, if somebody was hurt or injured in an event that we can attribute to water as a weapon or water as a trigger or water as a casualty of conflict. Um, so that's, that's the way we define it. And, and the definitions are uh, on, on the website. All of that information is available about definitions. Um, we also look at it by region. These are the UN, one of, one of the sets of UN regions. They may be a little different than World Bank regions. Um, and you can see the largest numbers of events uh, from the last century, over the last 117 years, are in northern Africa and the Middle East, in Western, what they call Western Asia, Eastern Africa, and to some degree in Southern, southern Asia. Um, so uh, we, we could go into to reasons why, but just to give you some regional breakdown. Um, some new concerns at this intersection. Obviously, water and economic development uh, is an issue when we start to think about causality here. Uh, poverty, water allocations, and water rights play a role. Um, increasingly, we're seeing more and more subnational conflicts over water rather than international conflicts. And this is an important point. Um, a lot of the work that's been done in this area has been nation-to-nation uh, -nation disputes. Um, uh, uh, Israel versus Jordan, Egypt versus the Sudan or Ethiopia, 
on these transnational rivers. Uh, if you look at the database, fewer and fewer of the, of the entries are nation-to-nation -nation disputes, nation-to-nation -nation violence. They are subnational, they're um, ethnic, they're local disputes. And that's actually quite logical when you think about it. First of all, nations ver there's a cost for nations to go to war or to have conflict with each other. Um, there are better mechanisms for nations to resolve disputes before they get, get to violence. Um, and many of those mechanisms are not available at the subnational level. So one question for clarification. Yeah. How, how would you categorize a conflict that is related to, let's say, foreign direct investment in some uh, project? So it's international in a sense, but it happens uh, locally. Is it an international dispute? Uh, I mean, there was a case, for instance, uh, in uh, Mali, in, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, if, if the parties involved are, are not nation states, we typically call them subnational disputes. But they may have roots in national failures, in state failure, in institutional problems. So um, I'm going to try not to answer too many questions now, or I'm going to run, <laughs> run out of time. Uh, we worry about water-related acts of terrorism, um, and we worry about the implications, both direct and indirect, increasingly, of the impacts of climate change, which is affecting water resources in many different ways. Um, an overview of some of the work that we're doing in this area. Uh, the first is, of course, data. We collect data. We integrate data. We work on data visualizations. Uh, we have a project with the World Resources Institute on integrating our water conflict data sets with some of their data sets on agricultural productivity and drought or extreme events and population migrations to see if we can get a better sense of causality here. Um, so we work on data. Uh, we do case studies, historical case studies of how water issues have led to conflict in the past. Uh, we look at causality. We look at temporal trends. We look at the factors involved. That's part of what we do. Uh, we look at theory, how might water issues lead to conflict. And perhaps most importantly, uh, ultimately what we're interested in is strategies to reduce the risks of conflicts over water. Uh, understanding causality, understanding trends, understanding regional issues helps us understand uh, and develop strategies to reduce water-related conflicts. And so for the last part of this, let me talk a little bit about that. Um, there are obviously political approaches to dealing with shared water resources, watershed treaties. And as I mentioned, there's been a lot of cooperation over the years in developing watershed treaties between and among nations. Uh, there are many specific international river basin treaties. The Nile, which has a treaty signed in 19... 49? 59. 59. 59. Between the Sudan and Egypt, but of course there are 10 nations that share the watershed of the Nile. Uh, the Colorado has a treaty signed in 1944 between the U.S. and Mexico that shares waters between the U.S. and Mexico and has a, creates an international commission. Uh, the, is Israel and Jordan have an agreement. Uh, there, there, are, there are many treaties, but I would also note there are very many international rivers for which there are not yet treaties or for which not all the parties are treaties, like the Nile, the 59 Nile Treaty, um, or uh, for which they don't address a whole series of issues that they need to address. For example, almost none of the international treaties over water address the issue of climate change and how to allocate shortages in the event of, or flooding in the context of climate change, which is a new fa relatively new factor for them. So mixed success, but that's a critical tool in this area. Uh, there are general principles of international water law, and there is the UN Convention on Shared International Water Courses that lay out principles for sharing water resources, obligation to share data, to resolve disputes peacefully, uh, equitable utilization of water, prevention of significant harm. You can see the list here. Uh, those are general principles. The critical issue is how do we apply them in practice in shared basins? And again, I would argue there's been some somewhat less success in, in that area. Uh, again, the 97 Watercourses Treaty Convention, which has now come into force, uh, is a piece of that puzzle. 
Uh, there are general principles of international, what we call laws of war, humanitarian law, uh, that protect civilians, protect civilian infrastructure, uh, protect the environment during war. And the Geneva Convention is a classic example of that. Uh, more critical from the water perspective is the additional protocols to the Geneva Convention signed in 1977, which explicitly provide protections for a lot of things, but including civilian water infrastructure, uh, irrigation systems, dams. So water is a component of that, an explicit component of that, that in theory provides some <coughs> guidelines for conflicting parties during war and conflict. Um, uh, the Environmental Modification Convention of 1978 that protects environmental resources is another example of that. A broader question and a critical question, and one I'm not going to talk that much about, but is actually probably the most important question here, is can we reduce the risk of conflict over water by a broader effort to move toward more sustainable management and use of water. It's this bigger question about water sustainability. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the Institute works extensively on sustainable management and use of water, on alternative sources of water supply, on looking at water demand and demand management, on proper application of economics, a whole set of tools that are relevant for water sustainability broadly that I believe could be enormously influential at reducing tensions and violence over water resources. So uh, let me break it up into a number of forms. There's a technical component to this. Um, can we improve the efficiency of water use in all sectors? Can we grow more food with less water? Can we meet urban and industrial demands for water with less water? and do the things we want. And that's this question of efficiency. The Institute does a lot of work on water use efficiency in both ag, agricultural and urban sectors. Um, and every cubic meter of water that we don't use to do the things we want reduces pressure on natural water systems, reduces pressure on shared water resources, reduces pressure on natural ecosystems. And that's a critical component of broader water sustainability. Similarly, um, on the technical side, uh, there are all sorts of things we can do to explore new supply options for water. We have argued for a long time that there are many parts of the world where traditional sources of water, tapping another river, drilling another groundwater well, are increasingly not available because we're reaching peak limits, what we call peak limits, on water availability. And this is the scarcity question that I think Andres is going to talk about. <laughs> um, but there are other supply options. Uh, collection, treatment, and reuse of wastewater. Uh, better stormwater capture and groundwater recharge. Desalination. Fog harvesting or rainwater harvesting. These are all traditionally considered non-traditional sources of supply, but they all have enormous potential in different places under different conditions. Uh, and they can do a lot to reduce tensions over shared water resources. There are economic questions here, enormous economic options for rethinking the way we subsidize water, reducing inappropriate subsidies, expanding different kinds of subsidies, reevaluating water pricing and water rates, uh, is critical on the economic side, reevaluating agricultural policies that may encourage inappropriate crops to be grown in certain regions. Um, in California, for example, uh, we used to grow uh, uh, a, million, a million acres of cotton, and now we grow less than 100,000 acres of cotton. Uh, cotton's a very water-intensive crop. Uh, there, there are economic reasons and policy reasons why we have shifted agricultural policies. But economics plays an enormous role in broadly sustainability around water issues. Institutions obviously play a critical role. Uh, joint basin management is important for shared watersheds, as I've mentioned, dispute resolution mechanisms. But institutional mechanisms broadly, uh, for example, and this is in the context of a lot of the recent discussion about 
water, the water energy nexus or the water energy food nexus or the water energy food climate nexus, which all of you have been involved in, um, our institutions have typically been set up in isolation. We have water institutions over here and energy institutions over there, for example. And yet we know that managing water and energy together can provide enormous economic, political, social, greenhouse gas emission benefits. And there's been a lot of interesting <coughs> conversation about that, which you've all been involved in. Uh, and that's partly an institutional question. And finally, political. Uh, I've addressed some of the political issues already. Effective and comprehensive joint agreements on international rivers, um, equitable water rights allocation and control. I haven't talked much about water rights, but that's a, an important piece of the equity debate. Uh, and the human right to water, which the UN declared in 2010, contributed to that debate. And now we're having an interesting conversation about the role that the human right to water can play in reducing tensions and inequities around water resources. Um, humanitarian law or the laws of war. I mentioned the Geneva Conventions and the protocols very explicitly protect civilian infrastructure. But as we've seen, especially recently in Iraq and Syria and Yemen, uh, uh, protection of civilian infrastructure has not always been effective, to, to be polite about it. Um, and civilian infrastructure, I would argue, has been intentionally targeted in the Middle East in recent years. Um, and I would make the argument that that's a violation of international law. Um, it, it raises the question about the effectiveness of of those laws about the effectiveness of international judicial systems. I won't go into those issues, but it's, it's an important part of the broader effort, I would argue, to reduce the vulnerability of water systems broadly to conflict. So uh, there are very strong links between water and, I would argue, energy and climate and security. Uh, conflicts over water seem to be growing, not shrinking which is the opposite of what I think we would like to see. Uh, the failure to address water issues broadly uh, is going to lead sometimes to inappropriate actions and to unnecessary risks around water. But conversely, very smart policies, broadly speaking, um, on sustainable water management uh, can be an effective way of reducing tensions and violence over water. But again, some of the trends, not all of the trends, but some of the trends are in the wrong direction. Um, and the strategy here, in my opinion, is to think about what's working in the sustainable management area around water, the technologies, the economic strategies, the political strategies, the institutional strategies that are working. Think about them in the context of conflicts over water, and maybe that's a new tool for reducing those tensions. Um, I have, I'll, I'll leave this here. There's some additional reference material. I wrote an article uh, in 2014 about the conflict in Syria and the connections between climate change and drought, human-related climate change and drought and the conflict in Syria. Um, there's a new article on broader transitions to freshwater sustainability in the uh, recent issue this year of PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, uh, Charlie Iceland and I did a paper, a, a white paper, that's on our website and the, and the World Resources Institute website on water security and conflict that talks a little bit about the project we have together. Um, and then there are two papers in review right now, um, Broadly, Water is a Weapon and Casualty of Conflict that talks about the international legal issues around these issues, and then a case study of recent conflicts in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen um, in the water-related related area as well. So let me stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. So we have uh, our second speaker, Anders, who is a senior water resource management specialist at the Global Water Practice here at the bank. So the, the floor is yours. It's 20 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's great to come talk to you, Peter. Um, we've been working together for, for many years. Uh, and actually, I'm coming from, from, from uh, a background. I'm not an economist, not an engineer. Uh, but resonates with uh, many of the things that you discussed. I did my PhD on um, the water negotiations between Jordan, uh, Palestine, and, and Israel, so more coming from the political science angle. But now I'm here, um, and I'm going to be talking about this publication that was launched earlier this year, 
um, which is um, the Water GP's uh, effort to, and I have copies here, and it's all also available online, um, to try to see how we can move beyond beyond the scarcity. I will speak about the scarcity, um, but really trying to see how we can um, move beyond it uh, in uh, the development in, in the region. And at the outset of when we started to think about this, this study, we asked ourselves basically um, three questions to guide uh, our assessment. The first one, um, well, this is more of a statement, but that's coming out of a question. So our water resources uh, in the region, uh, the MENA region, uh, managed sustainably. And then um, is uh, are people having access uh, to uh, waters, uh, water, water supply and water services? And then uh, how are the uh, are we doing with the risks? And uh, as you can see here, the, uh, the the responses to those questions are here. And I'm gonna I've structured the presentation <laughs> along those lines. I will look first at the um, the water resources, how they're managed, and this will of course be a, a bit of a flyover. So many things that can be said, but I will try to uh, dwell on a few of them. This comes as no surprise. Uh, we have the greatest depletion rates, uh, especially we talk about groundwater in the MENA, MENA region. Much of the water is uh, also not uh, uh, renewable. It's fossil aquifers like we have in Libya, we have them in Saudi Arabia, we have them in many places. So when you, when you actually empty those, uh, those sources, they, they're gone, basically. Uh, so that's, a, that's an additional challenge apart from from the northern one where you actually are depleting more than, in, than what is annually uh, renewable. We see challenges, uh, especially relating to the conflicts, to the refugee streams in a, in a country like Jordan, um, the, uh, the influx of refugees in the wake of the, or during the Syrian crisis has, has led to a further drawdown uh, on, in, in a country with, which already faced significant challenges of, 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 of lowering groundwater tables. Uh, so, so the conflicts in the region are adding to the challenges of uh, sustainable management of, of water. There's an additional uh, complication and challenge in the region. Um, you would think, uh, looking at the, the MENA region being the, the most water scarce in the world, that they would have a good water productivity, doing something useful with water. So I'm, 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 I'm stretching it a bit here, uh, being a bit provocative, but uh, we have many... Uh, countries which have extremely low water productivity. That's partly uh, explained by the fact that a lot of the water is allocated to uh, or used in the agricultural sector for irrigation, where the economic output is is not great. But it also tells us something that you were you were touching upon um, in terms of of uh, perhaps a mismatch between subsidies and and uh, you know the economic output you can get from from uh, each cubic meter of, of water. You also, on the other spectrum, have um, very high water productivity, but that comes partly because of the, the uh, lack of water in uh, mainly the GCC countries, and you, 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 uh, but at the same time, very high economic output. So per, per cubic meter, you have a very high economic output um, if you look at the, uh, at the GDP. Uh, this is, this is Social cost of water, or is it the private? Uh, because the, this is yeah. capturing everything. So the pricing of water being what it is, I'm assuming at the private level they are, they are profitable, but I think the, the study must be accounting. For well, that. actually, um, the water in many of these countries, including the GCC, is is uh, not priced appropriately. It's it's priced under what it should be. So, and that's. Particularly true for agricultural water, uh, but also for domestic and industrial uh, industrial water. But I think this is a metric of GDP divided by. Yes, water. yes, it, it is. So it's it's yes, it's so it's it's you know it's not this is not a perfect uh, perfect one, but it, it tells you something. Um, moving on, we we also in coming here to uh, to technologies etc. We didn't want to only look at doom and gloom, but rather trying to be. Um, um, looking at you know what opportunities do we have for new water? Desalination is of course one, but there are uh, 
downsides to that. It's, it's expensive. It's, um, I mean, re in relative terms, although the price is going down, it's, uh, it requires a lot of energy. Um, it has uh, the problem with the brine, which is the, the, uh, the leftovers, basically, when you've desalinated the water, with, which it's hard to get rid of. And right now, um, you are mainly disposing of that in, uh, in the seawater, which leads to an increasing uh, salinization in, for example, the, uh, the Arabian or Persian Gulf. Uh, which is a, a problem from many perspectives. So uh, looking at recycling and, and uh, the way the region is basically not making much, uh, a good use at present of, of uh, that, that resource. Less than 20% is treated and reused in agriculture. Um, a bit more is treated but then not used. And then most of the water, close to 60%, is untreated. Uh, which is a lost opportunity. It is also um, a massive environmental challenge um, as uh, sewage is, is flowing in, in streams and, and polluting also the groundwater. Another uh, challenge um, that we are seeing in the region is that in most of the countries, many of the countries, the, uh, the source is not diverse enough. And obviously, if you want to have better water security, you want to have a supply uh, that is diversified. I'm not going to go into detail here, but this this uh, shows you a bit of how uh, you're either very reliant on groundwater, like in the case of, of, um, of Libya, uh, which is not sustainable because that's a fossil aquifer. If you look to the left, uh, and they only have a very little uh, fresh water coming from um, from groundwater that is renewable, and that's basically it. Um, so, so there are many challenges here. Then looking at access, which is the, the second aspect that we're uh, trying to cover in this study um, in terms of access to supply, but also access to sanitation services. It is improving, although uh, many challenges still remain. And you would not be surprised by this either. There are uh, mainly challenges um, relating to the uh, areas and the countries where there are conflict that is uh, that is ongoing, uh, so Yemen, Syria, etc. And the same, more or less, is is true for for sanitation. Um, and you also see large economic losses from inadequate water supply and sanitation. And again, no surprise here. Uh, uh, the uh, conflict-affected countries, that's where you see it the most. And coming back to the, what we just discussed, actually, in terms of, of uh, tariffs, etc. Uh, if you compare the tariffs that are charged uh, to uh, water and waste, for water and wastewater in the region, they are way below the, the uh, global average. And, you know, we just added a couple of of, of figures here, just from other out of the out of the region countries or cities, rather to see how they how they compare. And it, as, as you can see, towards the bottom of the table, its water is basically free in um, in uh, a number of those major cities, which of course doesn't encourage a sustainable uh, use of <laughs> of the water as such. And then, um, finally, looking at uh, water-related risks, and they're coming the, in, in a link to what Peter talked about a bit. We know that they are growing, and they're growing in a number of, uh, of ways. One would be that uh, climate change is, is a driver of increased surface water uh, stress, uh, but also affects the, the groundwater. Um, from a transnational, transboundary perspective, as uh, Peter was saying, in, in most, if not all, of the transboundary agreements, water, well, the few that exist in the region, I should say, uh, water is allocated on a volumetric uh, basis, meaning that large fluctuations uh, are not captured, and that's what we are likely to see um, when climate change becomes even more uh, apparent in the region. So the countries would have to deal with not, not the average, as uh, was the assumption for the agreements, but rather uh, you know, outliers, which makes, makes for um, yeah, a mix of, of uh, you know, politically challenging discussions, even in the cases where agreements do exist. Oh, yeah, please. Uh, 
Um, and failure to address water challenges is also a driver of migration. Uh, this is just one example uh, where um, where uh, residents of those areas which have left uh, the areas have been uh, asked why they were uh, leaving, and many cited water as a, as uh, a main reason for for them to uh, to move. Transboundary uh, cooperation is a massive challenge. As I said, there are very few agreements as of now. Uh, between countries. Israel Jordan has one uh, in the Jordan Basin, but the Jordan Basin is made up of five countries. So Lebanon, Syria, Israel, and Palestine, uh, and Jordan. And now there's, a, there's a, an agreement between um, Israel and Jordan only. There is one agreement of sorts between Syria and Jordan um, on part of a tributary to, uh, to the Jordan, the Yarmouk River, uh, but it's not all encompassing. Um, there is also the uh, the Oslo uh, Oslo plan, rather than it's not an agreement; it's a it's a it's a uh, interim agreement uh, which covers water, uh, but doesn't go into the depth, and it's not final because that's part of the final uh, status negotiations whenever they uh, whenever they happen. So really, that's just an example of how um, a Five country basin is only having you know piecemeal uh, agreements, and same would be as Peter was saying also the case in in the Nile. And for many of the shared transboundary aquifers, the groundwater resources of which there are many, there is also a lack of agreements. There was one signed just like two years ago between Saudi Arabia and Jordan on the DC aquifer. Um, so there are there are positive developments on this, but very very that, that would be an exception rather than the rule that they actually do reach an agreement on, on these. And um, if you don't have an agreement, it's very hard to manage cooperatively. So whatever you can do, what, and what, whatever we can support in in, in, in this vein is also uh, positive. Just wanted to um, as uh, as an example here show what we try to do, it's, it's in the book, um, is to try to categorize and give a snapshot, obviously not all encompassing uh, for any, any of the countries here, but this is just an example here for, jo for Jordan. I will not go into detail here, but really looking on these three, at these three questions, the, uh, the way water resources are managed, sustainably not so, uh, not or not, um, the delivery of water services, um, and the way they deal with risk management, uh, looking at climate change, transboundary water security, etc. Uh, it's a snapshot, but I think it can tell you uh, can tell you something. This is and this is not this is not uh, perfect. It, uh, we will we will likely revisit this in the years to come and working with the countries. Uh, but this at least provides um, um, a, a, a quick um, overview and snapshot of of the situation as such. So, really, the take-home messages as we see them is that water security is much more than just coping uh, with uh, scarcity, which resonates very much with what Peter was, uh, was just telling us. Uh, the water governance challenges, whether it's looking at tariffs, uh, water productivity, um, is something that the region really needs to, to address. And, and this is not to say that this is easy. Uh, many of uh, the populations or large parts of the populations in the regions are depending either directly or indirectly for their livelihoods on agriculture. And it's logical that you then allocate, from one perspective, it's logical that you allocate a lot of the resource uh, to that sector. So if one would want to move away from that, then that's a process looking at the whole economy and the diversified and, and a diversified economy which can cater for uh, for jobs perhaps disappearing in the agricultural sector. So not trying to say that this is easy uh, at all. On the contrary, it requires um, a long-term approach and vision. There has been a focus on the supply-side solutions in the region, um, trying to create more water, desalination, etc., rather than addressing some of these underlying um, uh, challenges relating to to, to subsidies and, and basically demand management, of which there is a lot that can be done, coming back to what I said also about the potential for wastewater reuse. Um, so our conclusion uh, is that you, know, you need to look at the management side, you need 
of course, also to incorporate these technological um, solutions, trying to be at the front there. Uh, but this is, again, not a surprising conclusion. We need to look at all these in parallel and try to advance them um, jointly as we, as we go forward. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. So, uh, last but not least, uh, Christian, who is uh, an economist in the Commodities Unit in the uh, IMF Research Department. Oh, thank you, Robert. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, I'm happy to, uh, to have the opportunity to reflect on these uh, important and excellent presentations. I think I should start with um, reflecting on Peter's work, so let me... Uh, start there. I have some broad questions. I'm not sure whether you want to answer them after I've asked them, but uh, let, let's see how it goes. Um, so my first question, uh, as you have shown in one of your charts, is that water-related conflicts seem to have surged since 2012. And you already indicated that perhaps better reporting is at play here. Uh, are there other factors that come to mind? Is it policies and management capacities that are not keeping up to pace with regional and global change? Is it simply a number of wars that drive these numbers up? Is it all of them? Um, I would like to know. Um, my second question is what can we learn or what have you already learned from studying the specifics of these agreements around international river basins? Uh, so there seems to be a trend in the environmental economics literature to look at specifics of the resources involved in order to understand why it is hard to come to cooperation. But when I think about water agreements, I have a prior that many of these agreements involve relatively small number of countries, maybe two, three, four, five. And we know from game theory that uh, small coalitions should then at least be able to internalize a substantial fraction of the potential benefits from cooperation. So I'm interested why there's a mixed success regarding these agreements. Is it because of asymmetries, upstream, downstream aspects? Is it because water is a very diffuse resource and monitoring is extremely hard? Is it because enforcement is difficult because countries are, the countries involved are often poor? Um, then question three and four. Uh, you convincingly argue that water wars is not a great term and that we should think of water as a trigger, weapon, or target, and you list a number of options to reduce the cost of water scarcity in the context of, co of conflicts. So you mentioned technical, economic, institutional, and political options. Uh, my prior was, but then I saw on Anders' uh, last slide, is that supply uh, options would probably be more robust because they might not break down in the face of conflict. Uh, but I'm interested to hear your opinion, or maybe I'm asking the wrong question, as you've uh, hinted at before. So I'm curious uh, uh, what your view is on this. Point four is that how are countries currently financing these um, uh, expansion of water supply or improving their institutional uh, capacities? Um, does climate finance, as uh, outlined under the 2015 Paris Agreement, play a role? Or is this uh, still far off? Um, okay, so this brings me then to the questions for Anders. Um, how should I proceed? Do you yeah, keep good. Okay. And, and I think these questions might be relevant for both of you, so uh, feel free. Um, my first question for Anders relates to the role of the state. Uh, this is an issue that Rabba and I have discussed in the past. So if we look at the MENA region, uh, it doesn't perhaps surprise that the endowments of fossil fuels in that region have had a big influence on the formation of the state and the formation of its institutions, both in a legal and a fiscal sense. And this has been formalized by economists Tim Beasley and, and Pearson a while ago, who showed that states that face conflict or the prospect of conflict or are very reliant on oil dependence might invest less in these capacities. So in order to understand why perhaps water management is lacking, we should also look at uh, how other endowments 
influence the formation of institutions. So I think this goes beyond the idea that water, energy, and land are related in a technical sense. So hereby I mean that food requires a lot of water, the production of food, the production of energy requires water. But I'm talking about the fact that endowments together shape institutions. So the relationship then goes in both ways. It's not only <coughs> policies and institutions that affect resources, but other resources than water might shape institutions that are relevant for water. Another issue is that given the uh, scarcity of water in the region and the fact that water or agriculture is so water intense, that the, there's a trend towards more virtual water imports by the region. Um, I did my PhD on trade and the environment, and one of the main results of that literature is, is that if resources are not priced anywhere in the world, so if water is also mispriced in sub-Saharan Africa, if land is mispriced in sub-Saharan Africa, <coughs> then by importing more food from other parts of the world, then we're simply exporting the problems to other regions. And I can imagine that MENA, given its... Uh, its state might be excused from that, but I'm still interested whether that would be another way to prevent us from exporting uh, the problems to other regions. Um, I've heard something about the transition towards demand management. Um, so it seems inevitable that water needs to be priced. Would it be wise to start this transition very early and ramp it up slowly? Uh, behavioral economics tells us that water consumption is potentially influenced by habits. So uh, habits uh, change very slowly. So if you, if you also slowly introduce prices, then it might give rise to less resistance among citizens. Uh, there might be policy anticipation effects. So if investors see that water might be more expensive in 10 or 15 years from now, then it might affect their investments today. Um, so again, there might be reasons to, to, to communicate these policies today and, and, and get started as quickly as possible. Um, with an eye on the time, then let me <clears throat> jump to the last, <clears throat> excuse me, of my um, questions, is that how do we create <clears throat> a new water consciousness among citizens? Um, so if citizens realize it's in their best interest to actually save water, uh, there's no need for, for enforcement. So we are internalizing the externalities, if, if you will. And this coincides with a renewed focus, I would say, on trying to understand preference making and ideas in economics. And I'm sure this has been dealt with in other social sciences, but economists often lag behind because we want to formalize things. But nevertheless, there is a trend toward understanding this. So I give a couple of examples where this comes into play. And recently, um, Mukant and Danny Roderick have argued that existing anchors would make, would make it easier to persuade citizens um, to change their preferences, if you will. And in this context, I wonder to what extent um, religion might play a role because we know that environmental stewardship plays a role in almost any religion. So how can we create this new water consciousness? Are there particular channels that uh, might help us in, in, in essentially selling this idea? OK, I think this, this sums it up. Uh, thank you. How much time do we have? You want to go back to the first ones? Uh, yeah. So these are so the first, these are great questions. Every one of them is a, is somebody else's dissertation. Should be somebody <laughs> else's dissertation topic. Um, on the first one, uh, I mentioned the possibility of this is an observation artifact that we're just better at recording these. I don't think that's entirely the case. Mm -hmm. The fundamental factors, unfortunately, the the most recent examples um, in the database are pretty relentless targeting of civilian water systems in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. Uh, it's the large majority of the cases since 2014, really. Um, uh, so I, I, that, that's, just an, that's just an observation of the data. 
Um, on the second point, um, we've learned a lot from international river-based agreements. All the points that you've made, I think, are relevant. Uh, they typically are a small number of players. Um, we see agreements when the, the parties think it's in their interest to agree to something. Uh, it, it's hard to get an agreement over a river where one party is particularly powerful, has a big interest in not including other parties. And, you know, the good examples are we don't have an agreement on the Tigris and the Euphrates. Um, Turkey is an upstream. The Tigris and the Euphrates originate in Turkey, in the mountains of, of, of Turkey. Um, they have not had an interest in signing an agreement with Syria and Iraq, and the political tensions in the region haven't, haven't helped that. But, but Egypt is a downstream nation. They're the most powerful politically on the Nile. Um, they're not that interested in reopening the discussion from 1959 about allocation of water to the other eight countries upstream. And, and the tensions with Ethiopia right now over the Grand Renaissance Dam is a good example of that. Um, so there are lots of reasons why some river basins have successfully been, resulted in treaties and, and others haven't. The Indus, you know, the World Bank, Historically, the World Bank played a critical role in driving the 1960 agreement on the Indus. They made India and Pakistan come together and, and sign an agreement on the, on the Indus. Um, so there are opportunities for big institutions, international institutions, to facilitate that kind of thing. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't have an opinion about which is the most robust. It partly depends on what the cause of the particular conflict is. Um, the options for uh, addressing tensions over water or broadly, the options for moving toward more sustainability are all of those things. And what's most appropriate is a region-specific answer. Um, in the Western United States, we're not going to be expanding water supply in the traditional sense. We're not gonna build more dams. We're not going to take more water out of the Colorado River because we already take all of it. Uh, we're not going to overdraft groundwater more because it's already overdrafted. And, and that's one of the reasons why this is an answer to a later question. Demand management and water use efficiency is so attractive. It's because the potential technically and economically and institutionally to save water is much greater than the opportunity to expand traditional supply. But that's also why we're moving toward much greater use of treated wastewater and looking at alternative sources of supply. So um, I think all of the above, but depending on where, where you are. Um, I don't really have a great answer to the finance question. I think there are people in the room here who are probably far better equipped than me to, to answer that one. Um, but if you don't mind, keep going. <laughs> okay. Because um, on Andres' questions, uh, I have a couple of minor comments. Um, the virtual water question is a really good one. Uh, the, many of the countries in the MENA region will never be self-sufficient in agriculture. They don't have the water resources, and that's been true for decades. And that led to virtual water imports. It led to the whole field of virtual water imports and the understanding of we don't ship water, we ship grain because we can grow the grain in water-rich areas. Um, I do think that's going to grow. To some extent, that also does mean, and there's an interesting literature about this, we're exporting some water problems. We're causing water problems in, in grain growing regions by growing grain that's then exported. That, that's a policy issue. I think that can be addressed, but, but it's a legitimate question to ask. And Christian, you're one of the better people to answer it. Um, finally, uh, the, so, on the, on the demand management question, pricing is a critical issue. The more you price water, uh, the more incentive there is to use it efficiently. Uh, absolutely. But the other piece of that is that as we reach peak water in many regions, we run out of traditional supply options. The cost of traditional supply has gone up. Uh, the cost of building another dam, if you include all the costs, uh, the cost of building an aqueduct to move water from one place to another has gone up. And that makes water conservation and efficiency more cost effective. And we've done an analysis in the Western United States of the cost of demand management options 
compared to the cost of supply options. And the cost of demand management typically is far cheaper than the cost of building new supply. But I would also argue it's not only a pricing issue, um, it's a regulatory issue. So, for example, in the United States, we have a regulation that sets the efficiency standards for water using appliances, for toilets, dishwashers, washing machines. Those are federal standards. So anybody buying today in the United States a new toilet or a new dishwasher or a new washing machine is buying a more water efficient technology than was available 20 years ago by law. And that's not a, that wasn't an economic decision, it was a regulatory decision about efficiency standards. Um, so regulation also plays, plays a role on the demand management side. Um, in addition, it turns out, and this is my last comment, um, the cheapest energy efficiency options in the Western United States are water efficiency improvements. Let me say that again. The cheapest energy efficiency options are water efficiency improvements that save hot water. So you can save more energy and more greenhouse gases by reducing hot water demand more cheaply than almost any other energy efficiency option that's available. It's a water policy. And that gets back to this integration of water and energy that's part of the water energy nexus, um, and it's, it's a critical role for better institutional management of all of these resources. Okay, um, maybe... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, you can go back to all of you probably. Yeah. Comments on the <laughs> yeah. But let, let's, let's jump into the, the second one here on uh, virtual water input, just to complement uh, what you were saying, which is, I, don't know, I fully agree with it. Um, and in a way, yes, problems are exported, but we also see another trend, and it became uh, particularly apparent perhaps after the uh, food price uh, food uh, price crisis uh, in 2008 and nine. Um, where uh, countries in the MENA region, not not the least, were again trying to focus on food self-sufficiency. Now, not food security, but food self-sufficiency, uh, which is where you want to produce as much as possible in country. Parallel to that, there was also a, a, a trend for some of these water scarce countries, apart from trying to produce as much in, in internal as possible, to also lease land or buy land uh, in these more water-rich areas like Ethiopia, Sudan, etc. We see Saudi investments. Actually, the, it's not true that there was uh, an increasing trend in, in, in focusing on internally. For Saudi, that's an exception. After the, the 2009, they actually phased out their the wheat growing in the desert. But, but otherwise, uh, politically speaking, there's been, been, been that trend. And, um, so you see also an investment not only on f focusing on relying on the global food market for import of virtual water, uh, but also of the direct investments where you, buy, you are possibly able to control a bit more if you, uh, if you invest in, in a country like Ethiopia or in Sudan on, on agricultural uh, fields. So you have a bit more control uh, of the virtual water that you're actually importing. So that's that's another trend, and actually something we just chatted about before the presentation, where um, where new hydropolitical players, if you wish, come into play in a, in, in a basin like the Nile, where Saudi, where so sovereign wealth funds are investing in the basin. Um, and if you look at some of the contracts where they are available, they all, you, often they're not. Uh, it, it doesn't include a provision for water, um, it's meaning that it's then assumed that water is included. So how does that then affect the politics around uh, around the Nile, for example? And this is true in other places as well. But that's one of one of the one of the complicating factors that that has bearing on on your second second point um, second point here. Uh, Before you move, uh, just, uh, uh, oh, okay. Says, uh, no, no, just, just a quick remark on that, actually. Uh, when I was asking the question about foreign direct investments, what I had in mind was the case of the Malibia investments. So it was Libya investing in the office du Niger, 
in, in Mali. And actually, the contract leaked, and there was actually a water clause in the contract. Oh, there was. But the problem is that the clause was giving preferential treatment to the investor at the expense of the smallholder, the local smallholder producers, and then it created conflict, not over the purchase or the leasing of the land, but over the, the, the water, the anticipation of what would happen if a drought would happen, and then the preference was given to the investor, not to the, to the local farmers, and that was the source of the conflict. So sometimes there's no, the water is not in the contract, and when it is, it can be problematic uh, also from that angle. Yeah, exactly. Uh, oh, that's a very interesting point, and I think what, we, what has been termed as sometimes, depending on where you come from, as land grabbing is, is also turning out to be water grabbing uh, in, in, in a way. Um, so, so this is an area which is very interesting. It's under-researched. Um, it's building up better literature now, but, but really uh, it's, there's a lot to be done there. Uh, on your first uh, question here, I, I, very interesting, and I agree, very, very, good, uh, very good questions. Um, I hadn't th thought about it in, in, in this way, but, but now thinking about the, the, the linkages between water and, uh, and, uh, and energy, etc. I mean, you, you can see that institutions are being shaped in a, in a certain way. I can't yeah. give very, you know, very uh, thoughtful uh, response to it, but it's, it's certainly something I, I'd like to think more about. Yeah, uh, it just seems like a new angle. To yes, yes, next. which I hadn't thought about. So I agree with Peter. This is definitely something for a a, a, a coming PhD. If you flip to the next, uh, the next slide. Yes, on on demand manage, management. I, I agree. I mean, a slow price adjustment is is probably helpful and for sure needed if there's going to be any price adjustments. We see how sensitive um, the price adjustments are on, on on water. We see them, you know, on the bread and, and other things in in the region. And so if you are to have any chance of being successful on, on water, which is seen as a often a, a god-given uh, god-given uh, commodity, um, then it really needs to to, ha to have a slow price adjustments. And and there's also uh, the political angle to this is that uh, you know if you want to change the, the, the raising the raising the price of water is is going to be unpopular in any of any country, and uh, I would argue. Even more so in a in a in a drought prone country like like the Middle East, where where also religion plays a part uh, part in this, which takes me to your next question, where you talked about the new water consciousness. What what's what could be needed and, and useful and helpful in moving towards a new water consciousness? I think religion is is one. There's an interesting case I was being told in Jordan um, by the Secretary General of the Water Ministry uh, when they tried to move towards more of reuse of, treat, of treated wastewater for uh, irrigation. There was some, you know, social, cultural, religious um, hesitance, uh, and they were actually helped by uh, an imam issuing a fatwa that this is actually permissible under Islam to do this. So, so here you can see, and then the ministry had worked closely with the, uh, with the sheikh uh, to to get this going. So there, there is definitely scope for, to work in, in more perhaps unconventional ways in, in trying to bring about this new water consciousness. And this is one concrete example that I, I, I learned about. I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. On the, um, on the issue of uh, uh, water recycling, I think it might be related to the, uh, the notion that water, stagnant water is uh, a health risk. And I think this must have not evolve in ways that uh, one would want. If there is any uh, running question, yeah, please. Uh, yes, you mentioned so you could that use the uh, mic. often in the case of a water the water shortage, the mic. use the mic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, you pointed out that often these uh, watershed agreements are not signed by all the countries involved. I was just wondering if it doesn't sometimes actually create more immediate conflicts between those uh, countries that signed an agreement and those that preferred not to go along, um, especially because uh, you pointed out that those that sign usually can have or see the benefit that they would derive. And, and so to me, it seems like sometimes you may uh, prefer not to have a partial agreement uh, rather than uh, stoke new tensions. 
Um, first, thank you so much for the um, presentations. They're very interesting. I had a question about, um, in terms of dealing with the scarcity issue in the MENA region, um, I was surprised that there wasn't much attention to dealing with the issue of transmission losses, leakages. Um, I think that's sort of like kind of an easy win, whether it's in the ag sector or the urban sector. I'm just wondering to what extent do you think that more attention needs to be paid towards dealing with this leakage issue in a lot of the countries? You first. Yes, uh, mine is, uh, first of all, I'm not a specialist in water, so if the question fits us, we'll just try to discard it. But I think in the, in the presentation, there was more emphasis on how uh, conflicts are influenced by water in terms of availability and uh, others. Uh, my concern would be if there ever was any study in a regional basis or in the academia of how conflicts actually affect water because we have some water that just disappear from the, from the planet in the uh, Middle East e region, but also uh, ongoing or the quality being affected by the fact that in some areas uh, issues are arising. Is there, can you just come a bit on how, how this is, uh, let's say, studied uh, either in a, on a region or uh, globally? Yeah, sorry. Thank you for the presentations. So I just came back from two years of teaching and research in Iran. And as you know, the water situation in Iran, how, how uh, the critical it is. So I mean, there's 20 to 25 percent leakage in the Tehran's municipality based on the, the data, lowest price in the region, lowest productivity in the region. And uh, on top of that, we have virtual water export. Iran is one of the major watermelon exporters in the, in the world. Uh, and there is all these, you know, di you know, paradoxes in the country, and and also the water usage per capita is higher than the world average. Uh, so I mean, uh, trying to address the situation from this multifaceted, you know, dimensions. Uh, do you think demand management is the answer? Uh, because you know, agriculture is the highest demand, and Iran is, you know, agricultural is very, very traditional. Uh, huh? And at the, in watermelon, at least, and not not everything else. But we import a lot of food, but you know, in terms of watermelon, we are exporting it. But the point is this: and that if you, if you are trying to address this water and Iran in the past, we have you are facing Iran is facing six uh, the, the worst drought in the past six years as well right now, and people are just you know very uh, comfortable with this whole situation. They continue using water the same way they used to use it, and and uh, there is not much being seen from the price management and you know, demand management. How would you go about, you know, trying to get, you know, from new water consciousness at the level of the public and then at the level of, level of the policy, how to handle this situation? Uh, thanks very much. A couple of quick points. One, I mean, you focused on the some of the conflicts. I think the public health aspect in some ways is, has been getting more concerning. I mean, it, it's purely anecdotal, but I'm just thinking recently, cholera outbreak in Algeria, West Nile outbreak in Tunisia that both seem related to mismanagement of uh, of water resources. So it's something that, you know, you, you, we think of MENA countries normally as doing relatively well on, on public health, but uh, perhaps some signs of um, <clears throat> regression. On the virtual uh, water, well, I mean, another point is uh, <clears throat> trade policy uh, causing distortions in the export pattern. So, for example, Jordan and Morocco uh, exporting tomatoes, watermelons, mm -hmm. because they're given a trade preference uh, in the European Union to, uh, to do that. And it suits everybody to say the European Union were promoting value-added exports in Jordan and we're, you know, Jordan say we're creating jobs for refugees on these, on these farms. But from a water perspective, it's, uh, it's a terrible uh, uh, arrangement, but there's uh, trade policy we mutually agreed that, uh, that does that. And then finally, on your point about the, the, the broader sort of natural resource, <coughs> the natural resources nexus, I think, you know, MENA has this very complicated uh, resource endowment that takes uh, each needing a different type of governance uh, 
to manage effectively. So managing oil is, is a particular type of uh, governance that men actually, in many respects, is quite good at. Uh, you know, a resource curse, you know, say, has been, has been avoided, but maybe it's not so helpful in terms of water or land. So mobilizing the different types of governance that you need to manage oil and gas compared to, to, uh, to, to water and land has been, has been really challenging for the, for the, for the region. But, but thanks. These are all great, uh, great insights that have come today. Thanks, Rabbi. Okay, last one, last one. <clears throat> um. Two things. Um, first was just sort of responding on the issue of, of virtual water and something which um, wasn't mentioned, which is obviously the blue and green water split. Um, and just thoughts on um, clearly if, if you're substituting Middle Eastern grown, Middle Eastern blue water irrigated crop with, say, Asian grown green water crop, you're rather than exporting the externality, you're potentially actually enhancing global uh, maybe blue water. And, uh, Sorry. Blue water is yes. Um, so blue water being that water which is physically managed, abstracted from rivers and groundwater and applied to crops. Green water being rain-fed, rainfall-derived water directly to to crops. Um, green water being much more sufficient than the other than than blue water. Um, so that was just one one comment. Uh, a question, I guess, relates to the issue of risk and political risk. And it strikes me, and Anders and Peter, I'd, like, I'd be interested to hear your, your perspectives, but clearly you've got long-term or maybe immediate risks of water insecurity. But in terms of solving that, you've got absolute political certainties of, and as you indicated, social dislike or social unrest when changes try, uh, where, where, yeah, when we try to implement changes. And politically, therefore, it's much easier to sort of put things on the back burner, avoid those immediate known certainties of outcomes and kick, kick the water risk into the long grass. So how, how do you deal with that, with that dichotomy? How do you take a shorter term cost to avoid a longer term risk? Maybe we'll start with Christian. Uh, if you want to say something. Uh, no, I don't. Okay, I'll, I'll try to be as quick as possible. Uh, starting with your question here on, on um, yeah, negotiations and when, when you know, not, the, not all of the countries in the basin agree. Uh, the Nile would be an example of this. Uh, the recent cooperative framework agreement, which was negotiated over a 10-year period, uh, in the end, at around 2010, uh, uh, 2010, six countries decided to sign. Egypt and Sudan then pulls out of the negotiations, also pulls out of the joint institution, World Bank supported, and the Nile Basin Initiative. So that's a clear example of, of how that actually contributed to, to, to conflict. I mean, in a way, at least. Um, question about um, leakage uh, uh, and so forth. It's in the report. I didn't touch upon it, but it's a, it's a very good point. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's also an opportunity to increase, um, increase the, the water availability. We call it non-revenue water. That, that includes for, for leakage. But actually, uh, water theft is also a big uh, thing in many of these countries where, where farmers, I mean, at, at the domestic level, you know, yes, that might happen, but it's not, it's, the volumes are smaller. But at the farmer, farming level, it's, it's, it's actually a massive problem. Some of the countries, Jordan being a leader, has actually tried to go after this, which is, of course, uh, not, uh, not something that is done easily because it's uh, often powerful uh, farmers that are dependent on this or take advantage of it. Um, I will not go in all the quest on all the questions. On, on Iran... Demand management is definitely something they should consider. Uh, I guess for Iran, as in any other con uh, country, there will be vested interest, you know, whether it's connected to the farming of, uh, uh, of a particular crop or something else. Therefore, changes are not easy, and it's not going to happen unless there is a push from, from, uh, from, uh, from a power center. So I think that needs to come uh, together. Um, then public health, uh, yes, I think we see, I, I don't know figures whether if, if it actually become, become worse, but these are examples, and I you know if you include Yemen, which is of course a different case, it's, yeah. it's because of the war, um, it's, it's a massive 
um, uh, challenge. And with virtual water, yes, there are, of course, vested interest uh, from from EU, from, from the farmers, from everyone else. Yes, so it doesn't um, encourage uh, good, good water uh, management. Um, Michael, your point... I mean, I fully agree. Uh, the the way to achieve this is not easy. I think you need to uh, do a number of things, including you know you, you may work on the price a bit, but then you need to work on non-revenue water, water theft, in order to 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 um, capture some of these uh, the, the the water resource that's not being productively used to cater for some of the. Um, you know, dislike or, or what have you of uh, from the from the public uh, in addressing this, to trying to mitigate some of the of, of those. But it's a it's a tough it's a tough one. So I just answered most of those questions. I don't I really don't have too much to add. Um, just maybe a couple of quick comments. Uh, without a doubt, water is affected by conflict. Um, I, the the examples I've given of attacks on water systems during conflicts that start for whatever reason has been a has been a real challenge, and it's related to this health issue, um, cholera, which which honors mentioned and which you mentioned. Cholera in Yemen is directly associated with the destruction of the civilian water system there and the lack of safe water and sanitation. Now, it's a direct outcome of that conflict, in my opinion. And there have been over a million cases of cholera. And, and over two or 3,000 deaths already from cholera uh, as a result of that in, in Yemen alone. In Iran, the, the situation you described is, uh, it's, a cla- it's not unique to Iran. Uh, what you've described is characteristic of any water short region that doesn't, doesn't have good institutional management. The fact that there's a terrible drought and that the supply is decreased requires that you turn your attention to the way water is being used. But that requires that the the governments and the water managers help the public understand the nature of the problem. And if there isn't action at that level, the water users aren't going to do anything different. If there are no changes in prices, if there's no changes in regulation or no changes in monitoring or no changes in education, people aren't going to change their behavior. Um, and so that, that is a critical component to this. Uh, you need political attention to, the, to, to help change people's consciousness around, around water. Um, finally, this question about long-term cost versus sh- short-term cost versus long-term risk, we've never been good at that. It's the whole climate problem is a long-term risk that we could address if we were better at short-term, taking on short-term costs that have a longer-term benefit. And I'm not an economist, but maybe it would help if we stopped discounting at 6% everything. Um, and, and, and there are other economic tools as well that might be relevant for that. Well, this is the issue that the Lord House. Yeah. Well, and he, he always discounted at 6% yeah. too, though, which was a problem. <laughs> But yeah. But even at those, at that, I mean, his point is that even at that, this it, it made it. It was. It, it was still. It made sense. Yeah. But but of course, then the issue of part, of course, and this is true for all of these questions, is that the people who bear the costs and the people who reap the benefits are are rarely the same, either generationally or even in the communities we live, and and so so the equity issues around costs and benefits are really, really important as well. I think we're going to close here. Thank you, Peter, Andreas, Christian, and to all. Great.